So with that, let me welcome up our next panel. And this is a panel on authoritarianship. Uh, this is, again, we're experiencing something in the United States around Trump, but it's actually not just Trump. 60% of the world now lives under authoritarian leadership. Um, so this phenomena is happening all around the world. And in every, sense, in every place, there is a designated other that's perceived as a threat. So we have Doran Warren, who's, and you have a more complete bio in your program. He's the president of CCC, and he's also uh, co-chair of the Economic Security Project. Um, he's also a good friend and really smart. There's Marion Juan Torres, who traveled all the way across the pond from England. Uh, she's actually Spanish, but she lives in England. She's a researcher who participated in a phenomenal study called Hidden Tribes. And if you haven't seen it, you should look at it. Um, and uh, I'm on her board, uh, and she's gonna be talking to us about some of the research that she's been doing. And then there's um, Michael Tesler, who is a professor at UC Irvine uh, and writing about, he has a, a book I'll call Identity Crisis, a great book. They're gonna each talk uh, for about eight to 10 minutes and then we have a conversation between them. Uh, and we'll start with Michael and then we'll go to Marion and then Dorian. Thank you. Thank you. We can sit down probably. All right, thanks so much. It's a real honor to be here on such a distinguished panel. Uh, I don't know as much as my fellow panelists, so I will have to hide behind data, but hopefully we can make sense of it uh, and have a good conversation. So I'm gonna be talking today about authoritarianism and identity politics and really situating ethnocentrism as the focal driver of rising authoritarianism uh, both at home and probably abroad. I don't know as much about abroad. So I want to start with this graph here from the Washington Post that shows the growing alignment between authoritarian views and vote choice for president. And so we see in 1992, there's only about a 20 point difference between high authoritarians and low authoritarians and their support for Republican presidential candidates. But by 2016, that divide really expands and by, it's been gaining power for a while and in 2016, we're seeing a 50 point difference now between high authoritarians and low authoritarians. But one of the important things to note about authoritarianism, both in terms of theoretical um, conceptions going back to the 1950s and in empirical results, is that it has multiple components to it. So one of the components <coughs> is this moralistic component, rigid adherence to traditional values, moralistic condemn condemnation of those who violate societal conventions. And then there's an ethnocentric component also, in-group favoritism, intolerance of outgroups, nationalism, xenophobia. One of the things that shows up in the data is that the moralistic components were ascendant in Bush-Clinton era partisanship. That kind of goes with where the public dialogue was. We have the rise of the re religious right. We have President Clinton's moral indiscretions. We have uh, many efforts statewide and even constitutional to ban same-sex marriage. And those were the ascendant components. But what's happened in the Obama-Trump era is that the ethnocentric components of authoritarianism have become ascendant. And that's really what's driving this movement in today's uh, politics. One of the things we can see is how these two play out in the Republican primaries. And so authoritarians in the Republican primary in 2016 were cross-pressured. What that means is, is that the moralistic authoritarians aren't going to want to roll with Trump because he's a deeply immoral person. Um, the, uh, they tended to roll with, with Ted Cruz. But of course, the ethnocentric Republicans are going to be all about him. And this here is a graph from The Economist who runs their own survey. And you can see authoritarianism isn't doing that much work in predicting support for Trump. What is doing 
the work is this variable called racial resentment. What racial resentment gets at, and I'll show some more data, is basically that African Americans aren't trying hard enough to succeed. And that, that attitude really was a driver of support for Trump, both in the Democrat, uh, both in the Republican primary and in the general election. But when we're talking about the Trump era, we got to go back to the Obama era. What Obama did in terms of activating white racial resentment opposition to his candidacy, to his presidency. And I'll show a graph here that may or may not be easily readable. The solid line is what the relationship between things like racial resentment, anti-black stereotypes would have looked like if John McCain had faced Hillary Clinton. So we asked people, do you support John McCain versus Hillary Clinton? Asked the same people, do they support Barack Obama versus John McCain? And the dashed lines are Obama's two elections. And you can see that these racial attitudes really getting activated when it comes to Obama. One of the other things about Obama is we can't just look at Obama from a black-white binary. We have to think about the othering of Obama and how important that was in opposition to him. There is this superficial norm of racial equality, at least, that says, hey, we can't be overtly racist towards African Americans, although that is eroding uh, for some. But there is no norm when it comes to Muslims. And people feel quite comfortable saying uh, extremely Islamophobic things to us as survey researchers. So we have all these Islamophobic views out there in society. And they don't really get activated until this Obama is other becomes the, uh, becomes the uh, object of those attitudes. And of course, this will lead us right to Trump and birtherism. And so again, we, whoops. We see a similar relationship. Can you see my slides? All right. Uh, so again, nothing much in 2004, nothing for Clinton versus McCain, but then they really get activated when it comes to Obama. Then we see this exacerbation of racialization. When we see white racial resentment become even stronger in its predictions of support for Trump. So these are... Um, these are some graphs here uh, from 2016, 2012. Same people interviewed both surveys. And we can see that where these defections are taking place, when you talk about who are these white voters who switched from Obama to Trump, well, these are our high racial resentment voters. Trump is activating this more than a Clinton versus Rubio or Cruz matchup would do. And this is really where the dividing line in 2016 comes down. And I think the best, uh, the best kind of uh, quick explanation of this comes from this survey I did right after the election. So right after the election, there's all this talk about, oh, the forgotten Trump voter. And the Trump voters are, uh, they're forgotten, they're getting less than they deserve. Uh, it's all this economic anxiety stuff. But the dividing line didn't really come down to whether you thought average Americans, which psychological research shows as a synonymous category in people's minds with whites, that was not the dividing line in 2016. The dividing line in 2016 came down to the question of whether you thought racial and ethnic minorities were getting more or less than they deserve. So let me break down what this graph here is doing. It's a simple experiment. We're asking half the sample, do you think African Americans in recent years are getting less than they deserve? Do you think that average Americans are getting less than they deserve? We see a big overall gap in the full sample. People are 25 percentage points more likely to say that average Americans are getting less than they deserve than African Americans are getting less than they deserve. Notably, for African Americans, it's equal. African Americans think both African Americans and average Americans are getting less than they deserve. Clinton voters think both African Americans and average Americans are getting less than they deserve. For Trump voters, though, 
That's the real dividing line between Trump and Clinton voters, this question of racial deservingness that whites think that minority groups are getting less than, are getting too much, and that they are not getting enough. And that leads to an especially frightening component of Trump era politics, and this is the rise of white identity politics, both here and abroad. So one of the privileges of whiteness historically has meant not having to have a racial identity. The famous uh, philosopher Charles Mills in The Racial Contract writes about how whiteness is as natural to the white American as water is to the fish. And because of that relationship, because whites have not faced discrimination, deprivation, and isolation based upon their own uh, racial background, they haven't had to have as big a connection to their own racial identity. Whiteness equals American. But what we're seeing now, what we're seeing in Trump era politics is Trump making a dominant group feel like a minority. And that this, might, this dominant group feels that they're getting less than they deserve. And we're seeing this come out in politics in ways that we haven't before. And so we're seeing perceptions of discrimination of whites now predicting support in ways that it hadn't before. So what's typically happened in public opinion, African Americans' public opinion a lot to do with in-group attitudes. How much solidarity do I feel with other members of my race? For whites, historically, it's been out-group resentment. And now we're seeing this in-group component start to predict support for uh, politics in the Trump era. It also appears to be ascendant abroad, and so I don't know that much about European politics, but one of the things uh, that comes out in the data, this is from the British election study, is these perceptions of discrimination against whites are a really, really powerful predictor of public opinion about Brexit. Also about how white Europeans feel about Donald Trump. Donald Trump, his rhetoric, has become a symbol of white identity politics, not just at home, but also in European politics as well. So to wrap this up quickly, authoritarian is on the rise because of ethnocentrism and identity politics. Ethnocentric components of authoritarians are gaining power in partisanship and presidential voting relative to these more moralistic factors. And Trump is kind of the quintessential example of this. He is somebody who, both in his personal life and in his <laughs> whatever, does not display what we would think white evangelical Christians would be all about. However, when we're talking about white evangelical Christians, it's starting to appear that white is the salient identity more so than evangelical. Attitudes about race, as I mentioned, are increasingly shaping partisan preferences, but I'm going to end on a more optimistic note, that this polarization over race and identity cuts both ways. And what we are seeing is we are seeing positive movement. The country had been locked for 25, 30 years when it comes to racial attitudes. And there's a, a forthcoming book in political science called Racial Stasis. That we were in this racial stasis where the Democratic Party completely lost its will on race. There were no viable or not very public social movements advocating for racial equality and we were in a world of conservative racial retrenchment in terms of both court decisions and policies. What's happened since is we have a viable social movement. We have the Democratic Party talking about reparations. We have Trump showing to anybody who thought that racism was a thing of the past that, oh no, we have a long way to go. And what we are seeing in response is a movement, finally, for the first time in 25, 30 years in white racial attitudes. Whites acknowledging discrimination more. 
whites becoming more supportive of immigration, Islam, kneeling athletes. And so this is, we're in a very painful moment now, but this moment hopefully will lead to a greater belonging. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Miriam. Over the past two years, I've been working for an organization called More in Common. More in Common is an initiative um, that works to create more united, stronger societies that are more resilient to the increasing threats of division and polarization. We work for belonging in a way, and I work on the research side of the organization, which means that um, for the past couple of years, I've been looking at public opinion. I've been combining polling methodologies like large-scale sur surveys um, with other techniques from political science and social psychology to understand why we are currently in a moment in which there's increasing support for authoritarian populists. But before I talk about all of this, um, I want to share something personal as well. Um, Michael has talked a lot about identity, um, and I've been introduced as a Spanish here today. And identity is a big, big part of the story that we're talking about. It has to do a lot with othering and belonging. And it's somewhat ironic to me that I talk about identity when I've always had an identity crisis. So if you usually ask me where I'm from, I'll usually say, well, I'm from Barcelona. Partially because I think it's the best city in the world. Um, hopefully there will not be much contestation. I can get aggressive. Um, but also because I have a multi-layered identity. I know I'm from Barcelona. I know I'm Catalan. I know I'm European. And I know I'm Spanish. I rationally know that I'm Spanish. And yet, there's something in me that feels uncomfortable when I say that. I'm not a separatist. I don't know how many of you know about Catalan independence. Um, but this is very emotional. And I'm saying this because a lot of the issues that we're talking about are driven by emotion and not by rationality. But enough about myself. Um, over the past two years, we've been doing what we call segmentation studies. So in, di in different European countries where there's a rise in authoritarianism and in the United States, we've been trying to identify the different groups within society um, and which ones support more authoritarians, which ones don't, and how we can bring everyone together, how we can increase belonging. We see that in most societies, there's actually a group like the radical opponents in Germany or the identitarian nationalists in France who actually have those hardcore authoritarian views. But we also see how there's an open group that holds more open views. We are looking at it in relation to immigration and refugees quite a lot. And then we see that there are groups in the middle. And those groups in the middle are not homogeneous. It's not a monolith. And yet, sometimes they will support authoritarian leaders. Why is it happening now? We see increasing support for authoritarians across Europe and the United States. Um, we see guerre builders in the Netherlands, Marine Le Pen, Orban, Trump, Bolsonaro in Brazil. Um, I don't know how many are familiar with Greece. In Greece, there's a party called Golden Dawn, which is openly Nazi. Um, it's extremely scary. Matteo Salvini in his rise to power in Italy, and the last addition to the club, Santiago Abascal in Spain, which is campaigning on three things, anti-Catalan, anti-women, and anti-migrant. It's, it's great. <laughs> and we see that there's openness to authoritarians. Um, many are now saying that we need a strong leader willing to break the rules. There's openness to extreme measures. And we see that the group at the extreme is very convinced about the extreme measures. And then the ones in the middle are split, and there are real differences between... Well, I'll keep talking. <laughs> there are de real differences between the groups. So, is this surprising? There have always been authoritarian leader leaders, but I think that what's unique is that this is now happening in consolidated democracies. We thought this wouldn't happen in the places where we're seeing this. We never thought we could see this in the United States, or France, or Italy, perhaps, although Berlusconi, so who knows. Um, these parties also don't feed well into the right-left spectrum. So for example, in 2016, Marine Le Pen was campaigning with the slogan, neither la right nor left. The Swedish Democrats, for example, were presenting an alternative between immigration and welfare, so pro-welfare state. 
And something that's unique as well of the current moment is that they're internationally coordinated. Um, Far-right movements are very anchored on the nation state, on supremacy, and that used to be an obstacle for international cooperation. Now they've said, well, let's leave all of that behind and let's share practices, let's see how we can get this going. I think what we're seeing now is that the time is ripe for authoritarians. Um, John talked about um, demographic shifts, a lot of the changes that we're seeing, how this is creating anxiety. I call that instability factors. What we're also seeing is that currently authoritarians are successfully appealing to what we call people's core beliefs. There's a psychological underpinning to what we're seeing. And what we also see is that increasingly, most people in society feel a loss of their sense of belonging. There are, since 2016, um, and given the shifts that we're seeing in politics, we have seen um, a lot of arguments about what's causing what we're seeing. Is it culture or the economy? Is it an age divide? Is it, an, is it relative deprivation? Is it white supremacy? Is it social media? I think that there are trends and patterns that we see in all countries. All suffer from instability factors, but we cannot just talk about one single cause. Economic arguments hold some true. Um, we talk about relative deprivation, so it's not so much about who's the poorest in society, but actually who is losing out of, for example, globalization or no trends. But that doesn't hold in all places. For example, Brazil is an outlier in a lot of those factors because in Brazil, it's actually the economic elite who's voting for Bolsonaro and supporting him. We also hear about an age divide. And for example, I don't want to equate vote for Brexit with authoritarianism. I don't think that would be right. But it's true that there's a divide in the UK in the vote for Brexit. Nonetheless, unfortunately, it doesn't look like the young will save us. Support for Marine Le Pen in France was high among people who are between 35 and 49. In, the, in Italy as well, there's a lot of young people who like Salvini. And in Spain, for example, the new party Vox, um, or relatively new party Vox, has more followers on Instagram than all other parties together. In Brazil as well, there's a large following for Bolsonaro. So it's not going to be the young who are going to be saving us. Racism, white supremacy, and bigotry also play a role into this. And Michael has already talked about it, so I'm not going to delve into it. Is social media playing a role? Echo chambers, the fact that we only see what we like that's reinforcing our biases. It's also playing a role as well. And then we also see geographic divides. Um, it's, it holds in a lot of places in Europe and in the United States that there's an urban-rural divide. And I worked wanted to share a map with you. I think this is one of, as a researcher, this is one of the most fascinating things I've seen. If you look at the map on the left, um, those are the places in France where people most identify with the Gilets Jaunes movement. On the right, a map of the parts in France which are depopulating most rapidly. It's almost a perfect overlap. And yet, for example, in Brazil, it's actually people in large cities who are voting for Bolsonaro. So a lot of these instability factors are true in a lot of places, but are not the same everywhere. It's a combination of something that's creating frustration, that's creating anxiety, that's tapping into people's core beliefs and those feelings. And something that's true in all of the places that we have studied is that there's a real anti-elite sentiment and a lot of frustration. And to that, you have to add that there's an emerging will to try new things, particularly in those places that have seen huge cases of, of corruption or large austerity, like Italy or Greece or the United States, um, sorry, or, or Brazil. <laughs> Another thing that we see is that authoritarians are currently successfully appealing to people's core, core beliefs. Um, a lot of people who are not necessarily the core supporters of authoritarians have legit and valid concerns that might make us uncomfortable. They make me uncomfortable, some of those questions. 
But while some people who might have my same moral ma values dismiss those anxieties and concerns, authoritarians are providing very simple answers to those anxieties. People who felt their voices were not being heard, now they feel listened, and I believe by the wrong people. And what authoritarians are doing really well is heightening people's sense of fear. And fear is incredibly powerful. Fear is very mobilizing. In the same way that polarizing can be mobilizing, but it also poses a threat to demo democracy and our institutions. So at More in Common, we've tried to develop a model, called, which we call the core belief models, to try to understand the underlying psychological traits that drive polarization. We looked at tribalism or othering in group and out groups, moral foundations and perception of threat. I've learned a lot by doing this, um, and I wanted to share something. Um, people have different worldviews, and authoritarians are tapping into them. On October 1st, 2017, some Catalans um, organized an illegal referendum of self-determination. I was in London, but I was following everything closely um, and getting very anxious as time went by. Um, a lot of my family and friends had gone to vote, some in favor, some against. And these are the kind of pictures that I was seeing. Um, my cousin was hit, um, her boyfriend lost an eye in those events, um, and I could not understand how anybody in Spain could actually say these people shouldn't be voting. And it's right to send the armed police and prevent people from voting in this way. I was really nervous, and then it hit me based on everything that I was studying. There, there are fascist elements in Spain, and I'm not, don't use, not using it as loosely. We had 40 years of fascism. But there are a lot of people who do not support the right to self-determination that I cannot call racist or, authoritarianism, or authoritarians. Firstly, a lot of these people were not seeing the same pictures on their nose feet. They were seeing the opposite ones of people who were there confronting the armed for the, the, the forces. Um, and while my worldview is one in which I was seeing this as an illegal act that was legitimate and through the lens of care and fairness, um, they were actually seeing as a, as a threat to democracy, as a threat to unity, as we fought or we had to stand 40 years of dictatorship to reach democracy and now they're threatening us. So, thinking about their core beliefs actually made me be a bit more empathetic. And I think that this is also going to be key to moving forward and bridging rather than breaking. And finally, there's also an increased sense that belonging is being lost or that people no longer belong. In all of these countries, we've also asked whether people believe that they're a stranger in their own country. And there's a clear correlation between those who are more willing to support authoritarians now um, we don't call them authoritarians, obviously, in the work we're doing um, at when we are having the in-depth interviews on the focus groups. And, and this sense that something's changing and this sense of anxiety. So we're seeing these three things that I actually believe are making the time ripe for authoritarians. Identity has becoming, is becoming more group-centric. They're providing a narrow definition of us. There's a real anti-elite sentiment. Societies are polarized or, become, or becoming more polarized, and people are willing to try something new, and we need to come up with alternatives. It's complex. Um, I know my time's over, so I'm going to end um, here. But I want to say that on most days, I'm still an optimistic, because I may have an identity crisis, but I've been able to find home in different places. In 2016, I moved to Ghana which is an amazing country, and I found a home there because of the people that I met um, and because I had a sense of place. And I think that there are a lot of lessons to learn from outside of our bubbles and outside of our borders. Um, Ghana is a very interesting place because it has all of the elements that in political science predict conflict or civil war. And yet it's one of the most peaceful countries in the region, if not the most peaceful country. It has its issues. 
But I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that they have a real powerful story of we. Um, Ghanaians see themselves as a peaceful and sanction anything else. Um, so I'm hoping that in all of these countries where we're seeing increasing support for authoritarians, we can also have a bigger we, and we can start bridging rather than breaking. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank John Powell for organizing us again and to my colleagues, Miriam and Michael. Um, I said no when John asked me to come to this conference this year initially because I felt like I knew nothing about authoritarianism. And then I read American history <laughs> and um, I reconsidered. What I really appreciate about the way Professor Powell has organized us, especially this morning, is that we're not alone when you look at the rest of the world and when you look at our own history. And he posed to me, um, I'm supposed to answer the question, what is to be done? <laughs> uh, I, we're gonna all belong and own that question together. Because <laughs> there's no shortcuts, that's the punchline. <laughs> so let me just start by, by giving you some insight into how I approach this question. And to say, again, that we are not alone in the world in terms of the rise of authoritarianism. We are not exceptional in that sense. And of course, there are multiple causes. And again, I think if we just look at our own history, in some ways, if you think about the, the Confederate states of the South, they were sort of a semi-separate authoritarian state for centuries. And it's in some ways our own homegrown authoritarianism that started 400 years ago, right, that formed the basis of American racial capitalism that still is with us today in all the data that Professor Tesser showed you. So I think definitions of language are important here. So let me just give you my definition of authoritarianism. I want to add a little, another concept here. So authoritarianism we should make sure we look at what authoritarians do. It's a set of practices. It's a set of values, yes, but it's also a set of practices. And often, as we've lived through, what, the last three years now of this current administration, we get distracted by what dude is saying in the White House and not what he's doing. So it's important to look at what authoritarians do, especially when they're in power. And there's three ways, there's three things they seek to provide. Security, conformity, and obedience. Security, conformity, and obedience. And underneath all of those things is the weapon of fear. So authoritarians use fear in the American case of a racialized other, the fear of immigrants, the fear of Muslims, the fear of black people, and therefore the white we or the male we somehow needs protection and security against those threats. So there's fear undergirding this. There's a sense of conformity to tradition and way of life. Desegregation is changing our traditional way of life, or gender neutral bathrooms are changing our traditional way of life. And there's also obedience and loyalty to one leader that's demanded under authoritarianism. Now, I want to add another concept here because I think it goes hand in hand with authoritarianism, especially in what we're experiencing in the U.S. and around the world, and that's populism. Populism. And here I'm thinking of populism as a style of rhetoric, of political rhetoric, around the fundamental question of who should rule. Is it the people versus elites in the establishment? And you can have multiple kinds of Populism, you can have exclusionary populism, which is the kind that we've been experiencing recently. Sometimes, not often in our history, we have inclusionary populism. But we've mostly only known the racially exclusionary kind of populism, and it centers often the quote-unquote silent majority or the forgotten American, right? And so I introduced populism to this conversation of authoritarianism, because I think that populism and authoritarianism are almost always dates at the dance. They go to prom together. 
the dance of politics and power. They go hand in hand. And there's two moves that authoritarianism and populism play and have played. We just have seen this in our politics. It's directing fear and grievances upward at elites and outward and downward at scapegoated othered groups. That's the formula. So what do we do about it in my remaining three minutes? So John Powell said we have two competing visions of the we, and we believe in this room in an expansive vision of the we, but what is the strategy to recruit people to our vision and to transform the unjust power relations in order to live out that vision? And I would suggest that there are no shortcuts, that it takes building those short and long bridges, and how do you build those short and long bridges it's kind of an old tactic called organizing. Nothing news, no magic formula. <laughs> I wish I had some magic words for you that I could just say, go use those and the world will be different, but obviously it's not true. So if organizing is the no shortcut way, <laughs> right, to build the expansion vision of the we, to take on populism and authoritarianism, to take on exclusionary populism and authoritarianism, there are a couple of elements of the kind of organizing I'm talking about. So how do we support actual institutions that serve that bridging role that John talked about? And it has to go beyond just resistance efforts in the current moment. We're really, we've been masterful in some cases at resistance and it's absolutely 100% necessary. But we have to build something on the, side of the, on the other side of resistance. So how do we go from resistance to organization building efforts that focus on those who are other, that focus on those marginalized, that focused on the oppressed? And how do we offer, in building those institutions, alternative inclusionary visions where everyone belongs? Second, how do we find that common ground, that bridge building, through multi-issue, multi-racial organizing? I think a strong labor movement is a part of this equation. There's, in my mind, a correlation. It's a correlation between the rise of authoritarian populism and the decline of the American labor movement, which is one of the few institutions that gave people an alternative vision of who belongs and of power in a multiracial way at its best, when it was at its best. Because as I, I read everything Michael Tester writes. He has like 18 books, that's why John couldn't find one of them. He has a book every month, so I read everything he writes. And what I know from reading his work is the explanation that the rise, for instance, of Trumpism is all about economic anxiety is total bullshit. Because the, the rise of economic anxiety is necessary but not sufficient. Yes, it's part of the explanation. It's not mutually exclusive. It's not competing with race, and class, right? So the decline of labor institutions is somewhat related to the lack of an alternative vision around economic anxiety, for sure. But you can't ignore the racial resentment that Michael talked about. And so how do we think about rebuilding multiracial institutions with a broad vision of social justice that includes economic justice, but not exclusively, that gives people an alternative vision. So this is, this is my point about the labor movement. It's really important. It's not the solely important thing. We need other organizations, institutions, but it's super important. I think this is a moment, and it sounds a little platit platitudinous to say, if authoritarians use fear, what is the other option we have, people? And, oh, I, I didn't, I wasn't planning on that. Yes, love and hope. <laughs> That's really good. I'm going to amend my remarks. So we need two other things to fight fear. We need love and hope. Okay, thank you. See how we're co-creating this? We need love and hope. We actually need love and hope. There is no other way to overcome fear. And this is a time, at least in my lifetime, we are post-incremental in this moment. 
this is not the time for incremental policy solutions to the bold problems that we face. It's time for transform transformational solutions, transformational ideas. This is the moment, and we have to hold that door open for big, bold, transformational ideas with love and hope underneath them. We have to focus on the enablers of authoritarian regimes. It's not enough to target the authoritarians. We have to target the enablers of authoritarians. So what do I mean by that concretely? There's a campaign happening now, to make it real, that targets those leaving the administration to ensure they don't get those golden parachutes. So guess what? Former Department of Homeland Secretary Nielsen, you don't get the fancy, cushy job in the private sector when you leave for enabling hate using state power. The people that reward authoritarians are enablers and we have to stop them. Last but not least, I agree with Professor Powell on the bridging that's necessary the building of short and long bridges. Sometimes, and this is my last point, we need to rediscover disruptive power. And I don't mean just the protest that we show up and we have a sense of belonging and we feel good and we go home, but it wasn't disruptive. We need to rediscover disruptive power because what we know is nonviolent civil disobedience the research teaches us when confronted with a choice between armed struggle and nonviolent civil disobedience in authoritarian regimes, nonviolent civil disobedience wins out. Nonviolent civil disobedience, disruptive power that is sustainable, wins out. And I'll just leave you with this because I want to at least throw something controversial in the conversation. So I'm convinced, because he's an authoritarian, even if there's a landslide election and a Democratic nominee wins in 2020, Trump ain't leaving in 2021. He's not leaving the White House. He's just gonna say it's rigged, because that's what authoritarians do. He already said it last week in terms of the 2018 midterms. He's laid the groundwork for us. He's gonna say it was rigged. And then what's our strategy? We can rely on the military? We're gonna lie in the generals? What are we gonna do? Have we thought about it? Are we planning for it? It's a scenario that's very likely under authoritarian ruler. So the other option I see is some kind of disruptive civil resistance and disobedience where we have to be prepared to use it to shut down the normal operation of society. Strikes, boycotts. We have to have that in the toolbox to reverse the power relations and create the society where everyone belongs that we truly envision. Thank you. So thank you. And I uh, apologize for the sound problems that we're having. Uh, I think it's a little better not being close to the podium mic. Um, so I want to pick up on a couple of themes. Uh, one, let me go back to something, Michael, you raised, but also uh, Miriam and Doran, you sort of hinted at it. So we think about the sort of rise of white resentment, excuse me, white resentment in the United States and even across the globe. Um, but Michael, you also pointed out that there is a growing racial consciousness um, that is relatively new certainly in the last 25 years. Um, and so the, the literature suggests that white Democrats are actually far to the left of, on racial issues than they were five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, so it's important while we sort of think about Trump voters and racial resentment, we're also talking about whites who are more open to embracing race in a complicated way. Um, so is that a um, intervention we can build on? How do we find more white people like that? I mean, <laughs> how do we make them? <laughs> uh, I, I think it goes to, to what Dorian was saying, is that 
Without struggle, there is no progress, as Frederick Douglass said, and that is the way you make more of them, is to put it out there, to not, uh, I'm leaving here to debate Francis Fukuyama on <laughs> identity politics. Good luck. And <laughs> Fukuyama wants to go back to a time when it was all economics and not talk of, of race and identity. Well, <laughs> that economics was not free of identity politics. That economics was in the benefit of white domination. And just by sitting there and letting that exist without challenging it, without putting it forward, you're going to end up in racial stasis. So I think what's happening now, the movements that Dorian was talking about, the spotlight that Trump puts on the existence of racism in places of power to people. Anybody see Kyle Korver's essay yesterday? Mm -hmm. That thing was awesome because as a white man who is living in a society where whiteness is privilege, he did not see his teammates what they were going through. And I think that this raise of consciousness is bringing people like Kyle Korver to the fold and hopefully creating more of them. I'll just add quickly, uh, I was just rereading the fantastic book by uh, Jake Rosenfeld, sociologist, called what, what Unions Used to Do or What They Did or something like that. It's like past tense, right? Because um, there's no more labor movement. And although there's lots of teacher strikes, which is exciting. But he has this great chart in the book. And it, essentially, if you take a poor working class white man and you put him in an evangelical church versus a union, there's a political difference in terms of voting behavior and how they show up in the political world. And so it raises the question of what's happening in the, the institution of the union versus the institution of the evangelical church, which you mentioned earlier. And so we might want to unpack that because there's something happening in terms of kind of bridging conversations, I would argue, in the union context that's not happening in the evangelical church that's supposed to be about morality and belonging but is really about exclusion. So there's, and, you know, the labor movement has a complicated history, but the, the data actually is really revealing. I'm like, you take the same person and you put them in one of these two institutions and you get a radically different outcome. Right. Uh, Miriam, I'd, I'd like for you to, if you, if you want to go away on that question, but also have another question for you. To some extent, one of the most exciting potentially experiments in the last 50, 60 years is the EU. Um, and you can think of the EU as a way of sort of moving away from small nation politics that led to two world wars in a yeah. short period of time. And so the, these little countries say, you know what, we can't do this. We need something bigger. We need a new we. We need a European identity that's real. And to some extent that's happened. I mean, uh, but not perfectly. So with the BRITX, with rising nationalism, it actually looks back to those small nation states again, yeah. which would suggest more war, we would suggest climate deniers. So how do you see a, a, a way forward? And yet the way we did Europe, the way we did globalization, left too many people out as well. Yeah. How, how, so how do you speak to that? Yeah, I think that the, the, the last thing that you said is very key to understand this. I'm, I've always been a convinced Europeanist, and partially because of my identity crisis that I was referring to. Um, but this was, this was very much an elite project, in a way. And something that I've struggled with in the work that we do is the role of national identity. And the EU is a super nation, supranational project um, that kind of steals away from the idea of national sovereignty and the importance of national identity. But the reality is that actually people have that feeling, have that need to belong, have that need to feel anchored somewhere. And while some like me can find it in a global world and the idea of a European Union or a global identity that's not necessarily true for everyone. And I think that now that we've seen all of this change and there's what I call like a, vic a victimhood competition, that's really what a lot of the white identity that's rising now is about. People are going back to the nation state and you have authoritarians who are looking I don't, know whether, I, I don't know whether it's intentional or not, but they're really tapping into that sense of anxiety that they have, that people have, 
to their need and providing an answer, which is based on the nation state again. So I think that part of the question relies on actually trying to understand people's different core values and their worldview and trying to see how we can provide something, listen to those anxieties that's actually not the authoritarian answer. Mm -hmm. um, and as you were mentioning, we did this study of the American polarized landscape. And something that was very interesting as well is that we looked at these victimhood narratives as well. And our data very much aligns with what you were saying. This sense of why it's being persecuted really aligns with support for Donald Trump. But what was interesting as well is that on the other end, we saw the progressive activists, which is probably our people. Mm -hmm. um, and they had really cold feelings towards evangelicals. There was a lot of antagonizing an entire group as well, that I actually believe is a bit dangerous as well. Um, so I don't know what the answer is there, but I just wanted to mention it as well too. Well, I see the wrap up, wrap up sign that we're gonna just ignore for one minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, You're the boss. <laughs> so two things, I'll, I'll make one statement and then a, then a final question. Um, our identities are changing. Mm. So part of the anxiety that the right is experiencing is real. Yep. Identities, your children will not be, have the same identity that you have. This is really happening fast in California. Um, and, and we don't quite know what to do with it. Um, so in a lot of the work that all of you do, what we see is that um, the authoritarian leader is promising a past that we can't go back yeah. to. Mm -hmm. we, that, that past never was and never will be. Um, but we also see a lot of people are checking out. Yeah. A lot of people are deciding it's too confusing, it's too vitriolic, it's too mean, it's too polarized. Uh, so I'm just not going to participate. Um, and um, Marion, your study suggests that group is actually the largest group. It's very group. large, yeah. Um, so how do we actually get that group? How do we bridge with that group? So they belong and so they participate. Uh, in the last election, I, I used to say to people, if we vote, we win. Just that simple. Uh, and so the, the authoritarian game plan is to discourage people from voting. And if that doesn't work, then suppress the votes. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't work, then not to count the votes. And if that doesn't work, anyway. So how do we reach out to that group that's large uh, and turned off? A lot of them are young, a lot of them are people of color. Um, and they're cynical. Um, they don't trust government. They don't trust the process. Uh, they don't feel like they belong. How do we bring them in? I, one thing is, is that we can nominate somebody who looks like changing America, who represents the views of changing America, who is not wedded to the past, somebody like Hillary Clinton. And I always say, Hillary Clinton, if she would have come close to Barack Obama's black turnout numbers in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, she is the president of the United States. And so if you can nominate somebody who not only uh, looks like changing America, but also embodies the vision and doesn't have a history of saying incredibly offensive things when it comes to race, that's a good start. <laughs> I, mean, I would say um, two quick things. One is people have to experience some sense of empowerment yep. at the local level. And so I think we're in California. Pete Wilson in the 90s was an authoritarian populist. He wrote the playbook for Trump years later. And California's kind of turned it around last time I checked <laughs> through lots of organizing and building of institutions and bridge building. So, but people have to experience that and feel that at local level, state level, then you can get to national level. So my hometown of Chicago, it was kind of a big election last week. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> right, of people, you know, there's a reason why R. Kelly's going to jail now, because some people said, we're gonna vote the, the DA out of office and vote for this other woman, Kim Fox, who no one was paying attention to, but, Right? It made a difference in terms of how criminal justice is being enacted in the city. So there's a black woman who's also an out lesbian who's going to be the next mayor. Not perfect, but a big deal. But what, what is also missed is now the city council of 50 city council wards and districts has the largest progressive caucus ever. 
including, I think the number is somewhere between six to eight Democratic Socialist endorsed candidates, who are all non-white. So something's happening, and that gives people, right? So like to see like in my ward or district or local community that I can make a difference, whether it's participatory budgeting or voting for a reformer, I have to see that there is something different that is possible. The other thing I'll add is, can we just have more fun? I want to, I'm going to steal an idea. I'm going to steal an idea from my friend Rashad Robinson. I have on my viewing list the, the Beyonce documentary from Coachella and the Twilight Zone. Can we just have like viewing parties <laughs> and watch Beyonce and Jordan Peele and then like encourage people to go to the polls? You're on. And like You're have on. a little fun with it. You're on. You're on. Thank you. I absolutely agree with, with both of them. And we're seeing time over there. Um, but also we're seeing disengaged groups in all of the countries we're doing this. And they're different. Like here in the US, I think they're particularly susceptible or vulnerable to the appeal of Trump. In Italy, for example, this engaged group has actually quite open views. It's just like their sense of frustration and our voice doesn't, don't, voices don't matter and like we just give up, don't participate. So it's specific to each context, but there needs to be something else. There needs to be greater empowerment and there needs to be a positive vision, mm -hmm. which is really missing. It's missing in this country and it's missing in all of the places where we've done our work. Um, and maybe having some fun will be part of what's going to lead us to lead us to that vision. And yeah. Well, we are out of time, so I want to positive vision, love, and hope. And I want to say where everyone belongs: blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, everyone, animals, the earth, yeah. uh, and make it real. Um, and you know what? This group can make it happen. So I'm going to turn it over to our incredible DJ and. And uh, thank you for sharing the morning with us. A rousing round of applause for our panelists and the incredible John A. Powell.